Thank you. So um, I'd like everyone to um, turn to Luke 7, which is the part that we'll be looking at today and the part that God's um, given to me to share with you. Um, so you may have a physical Bible or you may have Bible Gateway. If you haven't heard of Bible Gateway, that's my go-to anyway if I've got a phone um, to find um, a passage of scripture. So what we're looking at today is two encounters which Jesus had with different people. And it's significant because it comes immediately after the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm sure we'll all be familiar with, um, but I can remind you of some of the DNA of, of that. Um, Jesus was on a place called, or believed to be on a place called the Mount of Beatitudes, which I'm hoping we'll get our slides and um, you'll see an image of the Mount of Beatitudes. So this is where traditionally it's felt that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. So he was there on the hill, or I think it was on a flat place, it says in the Bible, um, and speaking to people. And then what happened next? So we're calling this, what did Jesus do next? And what I'd like us to do is as we look at these two encounters, is also to kind of think about the Sermon on the Mount as well. Because in the Bible, I think it's wonderful how God can speak to us through a phrase, a word, a picture, something very tiny in the Bible can be extremely powerful, all powerful. But equally, God also speaks to us in the way that there are connections between things in the Bible. So it's not always just about one word or one image or one verse that God gives us, but about how that connects to what came before and what came after. So what I'd like to kind of explore today is how these two encounters directly connect back to what happened in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's all kind of interesting. Um, and um, just on those connections, um, the Sermon on the Mount also followed other things. Basically, Jesus spent a night in prayer. So that was really significant. So he spent all night praying. and It was a really pivotal time in his ministry where he was kind of unpacking his message and sort of bringing the DNA of the kingdom into the world around him. And after that, he then chose his apostles. So that was also significant. And then having chosen his apostles, he gave this sermon. And having given this sermon on the mount, he then had these encounters. So I kind of hope I can show you that, you know, that these are important things to see. You know, how did this roll out into day-to-day -day life? It's also significant because it's not just the Sermon on the Mount, but if you go even further back, um, we find um, about John the Baptist and the encounters that he had with people. And it's a similar pattern. You know, he talked to people in, um, just see, in chapter 3, verses 10 to 14 of Luke. He was talking to people. He was talking about Jesus. He was talking about what they needed to do, and he was baptizing people. And people kind of said the same to him. They said, you know, well, what do we do now? And it was kind of interesting. If you read those verses in chapter 3, 10 to 14, there are different groups of people that come up to John and say, well, what do we do? And then another group comes and says, what do we do? And he was kind of giving advice on how you actually work out um, what God is saying in your life. So I think that what is happening with these two encounters is a kind of unfurling of what God is saying. It's built on what John the Baptist said and how he gave practical advice to people on how things work out, and then what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount and how he worked things out. So if we have the next slide. So I think it's kind of like a rose, if you imagine, and I think when you look into how these Gospels are written, they're kind of... Luke was very intentional about how he unpacked, if you like, the message of what God is saying to us. So like, you know, a rose or a flower, it, it, you know, one petal comes out and another petal comes out and the whole thing gradually emerges. And I really believe that God uses nature and these images to help us understand the richness of what he has for us. So, you know, we can see that in these stories, in these encounters, it is a petal, but it's a petal in a really rich rose. There's so much behind it that we can, we can discover. So in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, what was the actual DNA of that? I'm not going to read the whole thing. 
Um, but just to point out a few of the core messages of the Sermon on the Mount. So particularly if you look at Luke 6, verse 31, Jesus said, you know, do to others as you wish that others would do to, to you. So as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. And that's like a fundamental thing, which also Jesus said kind of wrapped up what the commandments say. And it's very easy for us to relate to because when we're thinking about how to treat others and how to work with others we can use our own experience of how would we feel how would it work for us if someone said that to us or did that for us how would that make us feel and it gives us a brilliant example of, of what to do and Jesus applied that to his life and likewise verse 35 says love your enemies now this is absolutely explosive and it was probably explosive at the time, but I think it's still expo explosive in our world today. It still is. When we look at the conflicts around the world, when we look at the tensions, you know, the struggles for territory and all the things that come through that, the loving your enemies, well, you know, it's kind of below the bottom of the pile, isn't it? But as Christians and in the kingdom of God, it's like an upside down kingdom to the world. What the world considers the last thing that it would do this is what jesus placed right at the top you know and i love that because we know it's god don't we when it's just so countercultural to what's around us so this is our dna is to love our enemies and then the last thing that i'm just going to pick out from the sermon on the mount is in verse 46 and as jesus came to the end of the sermon he really kept starting to emphasize something he was saying that it's not just about what you're hearing you know it's nice to hear things, but it's actually about what you do. It's about your physical actions and how you actually roll this out. And Jesus said, the way to work it is to do what I tell you. So listen to what Jesus is saying and then work that out into your life. And then he finishes the Sermon on the Mount with that lovely picture um, of the wise man who built his house on the rock. We all know this, the song. So if we can have the next slide. So... He was <laughs> probably is actually <laughs> yesterday, tomorrow, and the day after. Yeah, it's just fun. It's so it's so relevant, isn't it? Anyway, um, but it's you know the, facing the storms in life and how we deal with them. And what Jesus said about this was this directly relates to his sermon. This actually, you know, building your life on the rock and being protected from storms is for people who do what Jesus said. So, you know, when he looks at that, it's not just a nice picture on its own. It's basically right at the end of that sermon. It's saying, if you do what I tell you, all those things, loving your enemies, treating people as you'd like to be treated, if you do those things, you will be like a person who's built their house on a rock. So that when the storms come, and it's not if, if only it was if, but it isn't if, it's when. When the storms come and hit us, and we're not protected from storms, but what happens is within the storm, we can stand firm. Then that's what we see. So we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. So let's move on then to look at these two stories. So first of all, um, let, I'm just going to read the first one, which is um, about Jesus' encounter with the centurion, which runs from chapter 7, um, verse 1, all the way down to verse 10. When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, i.e. the Sermon on the Mount, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was ill and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. 
I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So this is Jesus walking the talk. So we heard about the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus said, love your enemies, do to people as you would have them do to you. So here you can see that Jesus is actually demonstrating that in what he does. This was the enemy, yeah? This was the Roman occupying force. Not only that, it was the centurion who was one of the high-ranking officers. And the Roman Empire, we probably don't fully realize what that meant for the Jews at the time. But we know that Roman occupation meant many things. You know, complete and utter loss of power and authority in the country, freedom to reign, how um, the Jews would have wanted to do. The heavy taxation that was placed on them, which I think brought many to, even to starvation. And you can read about famines happening. The struggle that they had with faith, you know, the clash of having your allegiance to Caesar, but having your allegiance to Jehovah. And, you know, no opportunity to have justice. Rome held all of the authority. And if you crossed Rome, then, then you were going to be in a bad way. And we know that crucifixion, which Jesus suffered, was the ultimate brutality. So, you know, this was completely unflinching. It was completely brutal. It was complete control. And the centurion epitomized that. So this really was the enemy that Jesus was talking about. You know, this was one of those enemies. This was the, probably the force that the Jews would mumble and grumble and spend all their time thinking how they could get round all of the restrictions that were being placed on them. So there are many parallels to today. You know, we see enemies all around us. We see forces which kind of we come up against and just seem to be so difficult to get round, so difficult to work with, who oppress us in our daily lives, whether that's maybe government schemes or the benefit system, or it could be lots and lots of different things, and it will mean a different thing to each of us. And equally, we know out in the world with the oppression that we witness in so many countries that this is endemic and rife throughout society and throughout our world. So this is a picture of Jesus meeting power, Jesus meeting authority. So how would we react if we come up against an enemy, an authority? Well, I kind of think that maybe one of the reactions people generally have with centurions might be disgust. You know, how dare they come in and take over our nation and cause all these problems, all this agony and difficulty. And the idea of maybe avoiding them, you know, keeping away and just kind of doing the little as possible to connect with them in any way. But Jesus was totally different in the way that he encountered authority. So I think this is where we can learn so much. Jesus didn't react with disgust when this centurion, his servants, came to Jesus. The thing that we really see here is that, firstly, he listened he actually was open. He was open to hear what was being communicated by that authority. And as a result of him listening, he learned some really important things. He learned that there was good things happening with this centurion. The servants were saying, you know, this man loves our nation and he built our synagogue. Now, I don't know... Obviously, he must have built the synagogue. How he loved the nation was probably a bit of a struggle with his authority. But there was good in this man. There was good in this man. And the good was recognized by people. Jesus heard all this. He took it all in. He recognized it. And he perceived that goodness within someone who was an enemy. So I think this is key to loving our enemies. It's opening ourselves up and being willing to kind of see with spiritual eyes and actually see in the things that we find really difficult, in the things that we find we feel powerless against, that we find really hard, that we struggle with, there is still goodness in there. And what can really help us is just opening our eyes and opening our minds 
and being willing to think, hey, God, what are you saying? Where is something that is good in the difficulties here? No one is beyond being touched by God. And no one is beyond responding to God. So Jesus saw the faith of this man. He had said to his servants that he trusted Jesus. And you can kind of see a connection going on here, can't you? Jesus saw his faith in his trust. He had kind of, the centurion had moved in some way. The centurion recognized Jesus. He actually saw Jesus, just as Jesus was listening to him. He saw Jesus' authority, and he understood that um, Jesus could act in the same way that he acted. So even the world's powers, even powers that we think of as evil, there still can be a way that those powers can recognize God's power. Isn't that amazing? We just never would really think that that could happen. But this is an example of where that actually happened. The world's powers were recognizing God's power. And this, I think, I'd like to suggest you is a bridge. Thanks, you put the slide over. (laughs) Someone's ahead. Um, This is a bridge. And I think what God is saying is that there are always bridges. So when we're encountering things that are difficult, we might be frightened of power. We might be cowed by power. We might want to run away from power, but there are always bridges, and God can show us where those bridges are. But if we open ourselves up and listen and perceive them, we can use those bridges to build faith. So Jesus recognized that, and he valued the centurion's faith. Isn't that amazing? He spoke well of it. He said to others, you know, I haven't seen faith like this anywhere in Israel. So he actually boasted of something which the enemy was doing, which was connecting with God. He, you know, he encouraged that centurion. That would have got back to the centurion. He would have been so encouraged by that. And this is the bridge that Jesus crossed back over. So as we see bridges where people are recognizing God, we can cross back by encouraging that, by pointing it out, by putting our finger on it, by saying something to people, by pointing to it, and by holding it up as something really wonderful. So I think this is something that we can really hold on to that will help us when we're dealing with authority and when we're dealing with enemies. So Jesus recognized the bridges and he used them to cross back. And I think that as a result of him crossing back across that bridge, we don't know where that may have led to in that centurion's life. We don't know. But I believe that something spiritual was going on there. And I think we can't know what God is doing, but we know that as we see the bridge, as we know where it is, as we allow God to take us across that bridge, to point it out, encourage someone, we can leave it with God. I think it's interesting with these encounters that Jesus didn't go to his house, you know. I mean, the centurion said, don't come. They never actually met. It was all done sort of by third hand. And we don't know if Jesus ever had another encounter with him again. And I think sometimes we don't need to necessarily try and follow things all the way to the end. We can just drop in where we feel God is is working and then just pray that God will make that grow. Because there may be another bridge. There may be someone else who picks picks up on that um, further down the line. But what God does want us to do is to get out and to encourage that. So let's move on to our second encounter, which is Jesus encountering a widow. So that's Luke 7, verses 11 to 16. So I'm just going to read that now. So it says, Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The young man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. 
A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So having just shown this encounter down one end of the spectrum, I think, you know, Jesus probably encountering the most powerful individual, apart from Pilate, that he may have encountered personally through his ministry, we're now literally going all the way to the other end of the spectrum. And I think what God is saying here is that God covers from A to Z, if you like. If one was A and the other one was Z, they couldn't basically be any further apart, could they? A centurion and a widow. Um, Jesus would have been comfortable dealing with someone, quite probably an elite, such as that soldier, and used to brutality. But equally, he was comfortable dealing with the most vulnerable person in society who would have been a widow. So in Jewish society, um, the uh, earnings, if you like, and, and the sort of economic wealth of the nation was generally earned by men. And so a woman would need to be attached to a man in order to have security and, and have, you know, sort of her means of income, usually. So the fact that this woman had lost um, her husband, she was a widow, and now also she had lost her son, who was her only son, meant that there was no male around her anymore to give her any economic support. So she would have been in a really dire situation with really no hope of income and really kind of thrust on society, except that I think they had even less of a safety net than we have in those days. So, you know, she really would have been very, very vulnerable. And, you know, having no sons, it was also a big thing in, in the culture of the Jews. You know, having children was your kind of worth, if you like, very much traditionally. You know, if you have children, particularly if you have sons, then you're, you know, the more sons, the better, and all that kind of thing. This went all the way back through the culture and the prevailing um, lands around them as well. Having sons and having children was what made you upstanding in society. You know, I've got all these children, I've got all these sons, but she only had one son and then this son had died. So, you know, her worth and her value in society would have just been at, at rock bottom. So I just want to kind of step aside now from, from the story, just a little cameo, you know, like when you're in a film and you have this like little cameo, because there's something in this story that really struck me, and I think God does this. I think God's got a great sense of humor. So what it is, is if you imagine this uh, like a tableau, like, you know, um, a nativity where you've got Jesus and the donkey and you've got all the different players around you, and you're like, wow, that's an interesting scene. What really strikes you in this story is there's a bit of a scene going on. So I thought we'd just explore that because I think it's something really powerful that, that God can say to us. And it's the story of two directions. So if you imagine the scene, you've got two crowds. The one crowd has just come from the healing of the centurion's servant. And, you know, all this excitement about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is doing all these amazing things and we're following Jesus and... Everything is just awesome, basically. So Jesus is, you can imagine the excitement and the buzz going on as they follow Jesus. What's, what's going to happen next and what, what's going to go on? So you've got this really excited, happy crowd following Jesus, full of hope. But then they meet another crowd. And this crowd is very different. And it says there's a crowd. They're coming out of the town, but a completely different scenario. This is a crowd full of despair. You know, this has happened to this woman, the woman, the, the last woman you would want it to happen to, the worst has happened. And they're trying to support her as she buries her son. So they come out of the, of the town. So one is a crowd of life, but one is a crowd of death. One is a crowd of generosity, but one is a crowd, crowd of poverty, of need and of want. One is a crowd of righteousness led by Jesus, but I'd say the other crowd kind of represents sin and death. It represents the world without Jesus. And the other thing that's really significant in this kind of scene is where this happens. Jesus could have kind of met this procession out of town as, it, as they came through the gate, or he could have gone into the town and met them as they were in the town. But 
I think it's really significant that this happens at the gate, and it makes mention of the fact that this encounter is happening just as Jesus reaches the gate. And we know that gates are really pivotal places. <gasps> King's Gate. <laughs> we ourselves, our DNA is all about gates, and I think it's significant where we are. It is significant. We are at the gate of Kingston. We are King's Gate, and I think something really profound and spiritual with what God is doing for us as a church at the gate of Kingston. It's a pivotal place. You can go in and you can go out, and it's a pivotal time in the procession as they pass through that gate. That widow would have felt something as she left that town on her way to the burial ground. It was a pivotal time for Jesus on his journey as he was entering into a new town with new opportunities to serve. This is opening up the gates so the king of glory can come in. So the timing was no, no coincidence. And I think that that gives this story even more emphasis because of the pivotal way that it happened. God orders our steps and directs our path. So I think what God is saying to us is that timing is so important. And I think that, you know, we were saying we need to listen to things. I think that the fact this happened at the gate, the fact this happened with two crowds, I think it's significant. And I think as we live our lives, you know, something might happen. We might go to a place or we might meet someone. And I think we need to have our spiritual antennae up and say, you know, is this significant? What is God saying here? What is God doing here? What is happening in the spiritual realm in this situation, in where we are as a church, in what is happening? Let's learn where God is going, where his spirit is, is pointing. So anyway, that was my little, little tableau. We're going to now go back into, back into the story. So how did Jesus deal with this one? We know how he dealt with the centurion. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Actually, really interesting how he dealt with this one really consistently in accordance with how he dealt with the centurion very similar. And I think what it's saying is it's reinforcing how we deal with all these different situations. Actually, we just have to remember to approach them pretty much the same way, whether it's power or whether it's vulnerability. So how did Jesus deal with it? So again, the key thing was he noticed. Now, he could have just walked past this crowd and carried on into the town. He could have just, you know, okay, that's happening. Let's keep going. But he didn't. He noticed, he saw what was going on. He saw, he listened, he assessed the situation. He took it all in. So I think this is something God is reinforcing to us that as we go about our lives, God wants us to have our antennae up, be aware of what God is saying, you know, pointing out to us, showing us things. We need to have all of our powers of observation to really listen in the spiritual with what God is doing and take it all in. Give it our full attention. Do we notice God might be wanting us to have an encounter? And then Jesus also demonstrated God's love by treating people well. He sees us and he wants us to see things. He treated this woman with such dignity. And Jesus, the way he, he dealt with this was he went straight to where the pain was most felt. He went straight to the woman and to the coffin. And he went to the heart of her pain, which was her loss. He didn't kind of skirt around the edges and I'll just stand on the edge of the cloud and see what's going on. He went straight in there to the center of her loss. So if we may, some of us, I think, may be fine in dealing with authority but may struggle with vulnerability and some might be the opposite and some of us might struggle with both things extremes if you like but I think God wants to teach us to be confident that we're with him as we open ourselves up and observe we can go to the heart of the pain we can go to the heart of the vulnerability and Jesus showed this by touching the coffin which I believe made him unclean I'm sure Keith would know these things it probably would have made him unclean in Jewish culture because you can't, certainly can't touch your dead body, but I imagine the coffin is all seen as part of the same thing. So Jesus actually entered into her suffering. He became unclean, in a sense, because he touched that coffin, which would have been really taboo that you don't do this, but Jesus did do it. 
Jesus did become unclean for us. And I think it's a picture of how he connected with us in our lostness, that he touched us. And I think this is the key of this. Just as he touched the centurion by the way that he held up his faith, he connected, he used that bridge to connect, to actually cross that bridge over very tenderly to this widow. And I think it's at these key points where we have these bridges and seeing the bridges that we can then see God crossing those bridges. This is where God's power comes in to our encounters as we touch that in whatever way that might be. And God's power em- entered in and touches the suffering that we see. So this kind of elevates things. Like Jesus elevated that widow. You know, he could have walked around the edge. He could have just stood on the sidelines. But he went to the most vulnerable and he raised her up. Out of all the people that were around them, she was his sole attention. He went to the one who was the most needy and said, you're special. I care about you. God cares about you. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to see people raised from the dead, although I know we are to be expectant, as we have been saying. You know, what happened here, we know, is that the spirit of that son had gone out of his body when he died. But I think it actually says here, um, the dead man sat up. But I actually read this morning another story where Jesus raised the uh, 12-year-old girl as well. And it says her spirit returned. So Jesus touched that coffin and said, "Um, young man, uh, um, um, get up. His spirit came back into his body. And God has the power to do that. You know, he has the power to bring back a spirit into a body just as you know, a spirit can leave. So um, as Jesus touched her, God, through his power, brought that spirit back in and allowed God's power to flow. Now, if we don't raise people from the dead, but I'm going to be expected that if he may not bring a spirit back for us, but what he can do, God will bring power and will bring life in whatever way that might be. So it might be healing for that person. It might be mental healing. It might be physical healing. It might be them understanding a way through that they hadn't understood before, whatever it can be, God can enter in and God can bring his power in. So let's be expectant and excited as we see the bridges, as we go across the bridges, we will see God's power move. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next slide, which we're nearly at the end. So we're just kind of going, going back to here. I think there should be another one of a bridge. Is there one of a bridge? There, that's it. We'll leave it on that one. So just concluding then, um, I just wanted to encourage us all not to be afraid of power. I know I think I have a bit of fear in this area when I see power and, and what can happen and the systems that we are often up against um, and some of the politics that we see as well and, and the kind of way that things are manipulated and controlled and the media and lots of different things it's easy to be afraid of all of that but equally we can be afraid of vulnerability it just looks so difficult to unpick sometimes I think of like a tangle of rubber bands you know when you get rubber bands that are round and round and round each other and they just form this massive knot and you're like how do we kind of get through that it's quite hard and it's quite challenging We can find one or both of those difficult, but it's okay. Jesus is calling us out of our comfort zone, and he gives us the courage to step forward. And I think this is not just something for us as individuals, but I think this is something for us as a church. You know, I really believe that Kingsgate, the way that we're positioned, the way that God has been calling us in the last three years, and as we've come into this building and we are serving, that, you know, he's called us into a place where we will be encountering power, we will be encountering government and agencies and different influences, but equally we're going to be encountering the most vulnerable as well. You know, we're here for the whole range of people who are around us. But I think God wants to encourage us collectively as well. So I think these things are not just for us individually, but collectively and teaching us and helping us and strengthening us as we engage with power, as we engage with vulnerability as a church, 
in the ministries that we do, that God will bless us as we follow what Jesus said and as we love our enemies and as we connect with others and we, we see God's power flow. So let's collectively also see what's going on with our spiritual eyes and ears. Let's recognize the boundaries, the good, even in our enemies, even in the difficulties we face and the powers that we deal with and, and in the suffering to acknowledge it and not just think about it, but to actually openly listen to what God's saying and use those bridges to allow God's power to flow. And then we will see God's glory. So we can then be strengthened as a result. And just want to finish with that picture of the, or not the slide, but just the image of the, the wise man with the house on the rock. Jesus said, if you do these words, you will be like the person who built their house on the rock. So I think actually there's a benefit for us as well. You know, we're not just building God's kingdom, but through being obedient to God, through honoring God, through working out the steps of what it means to live our faith, I think we are strengthened. You know, Jesus said, you'll be like a person who's built foundations. So doing these things builds foundations. It kind of gives us a kind of underpinnings, a structure. And I think that it somehow protects us. When we come to face difficulties and trials, I think these things that we're practicing, and working out, they will give us solidity. And maybe that's also for us as a church. They will give us as a church strength and solidity that will allow us to withstand all of the challenges that we, that we face. It will look strange. The world won't understand it. We know that because the world is opposite. So basically the world would have done this very, very different. Um, so it's going to result in raised eyebrows. You know, why are you bothering with that? Why are you doing this? But we have, can single-mindedly focus on these things, knowing that this is how Jesus did it. This is, this is the right way. So I think I will close there. Thank you.